family mode. I walked out my door one day and saw these little black ants all over this uh, cricket. The cricket was still twitching, and they were uh, ripping it apart in little pieces and carrying it off to the nest. Uh, this is outside of a trash can, uh, acrobat ants feeding on a piece of fatty meat that was discarded or fell outside the trash can. <coughs> Here's a field ant feeding on bird dung. So they take advantage of any resource. But one of the most common things that they use, adult ants need, they don't feed on solid food. The larvae are the ones that feed on the solid food in the colony. The, the acrobat, I mean, the, the, the um, worker ants, uh, take advantage of uh, honeydew-producing insects like uh, scales and uh, plant hoppers and, and especially aphids as seen here, these acrobat ants on aphids. And they uh, consume the honeydew and uh, for energy themselves and to take it back and feed other members of the colony, including the queen. It's one of the reasons that uh, gel baits and liquid baits uh, can be so effective um, and get such a response from ants when you put those out. Uh, they like the moisture. They like the something they can buy all the way into their bodies. Here's a carpenter ant feeding on uh, honeydew from a plant hopper. I was out in Hawaii, um, and we went to a structure that was having a problem with white-footed ants. They had flowering shrubs outside next to the structure. This is one bloom, and when I took a, this bloom and I put it inside a Ziploc bag and shook it, I got hundreds of ants off a single bloom. You can see there's, there's an ant here. There's another one there. But uh, these are all these other black dots are aphids feeding in, inside of this plant. And this, these, these shrubs are covered with aphids. So the, ideally, the, the control uh, solution, um, besides finding the colonies, was having them get a turf and ornamental company out there to treat the shrubs uh, for the aphids, to kill the aphids, uh, which would um, thereby uh, make it less of a resource for ants and cause them to forage elsewhere. But you still needed to, to do your perimeter treatments and, and find the colonies and treat them as much as possible. So trailing habits. This comes in handy when you're, you're looking for ants. All ants follow uh, structural guidelines, you know, as we do as humans. If you look at this picture, this map, all these driveways when we drive, all these roads, the parking lots, the sidewalks, um, and we get inside buildings, the hallways, we follow structural guidelines. When we're fishing, we follow structural guidelines, the rivers and creeks. You know, all animals, and particularly insects, and, 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 and especially ants, follow structural guidelines. So on this particular case, we've got acrobat ants following a, a barbed wire that was uh, crossing this uh, tree here uh, as, as part of the fence, um, a structural guideline. Here's the edge of a, a patio, structural guideline, an odorous house ants. This is a big-headed ants on a hose, water hose, going from the nest all the way up to the structure following the water hose. Again, a structural guideline. We had a house that uh, saw some uh, big-headed ants put out a drop of jelly and followed the ants along the structural guideline, the edge of the tile, all the way back to this, I think it's this point here or this point, the next slide. And this is where they were nesting under the slab. They're going inside, in and out, in and out. So this is where the nest was located. So putting down the jelly and establishing a trail it's called pre-baiting, and following the trail back to the nest site is a way to, to identify nest sites when you're having difficulty, especially when you're having difficulty uh, finding the colony. So some control basics. Starts with the ant. Know your ant. Find where it lives and treat it where it lives, and you'll have greater success with your control of ants. Um, again, wood nesting ant, soil nesting ant, opportunistic ant. These are ghost ants underneath. Uh, leaf litter, uh, again, displaced soil, um, but, but know your ant, find where it lives, and treat it where it lives. Displaced soil. This is fire ants, uh, ex excavated soil they brought to the top of the stump, which is kind of an interesting uh, thing that you see uh, sometimes in the south. You want to pull vegetation away from the foundation. I found that ants will readily trail here, and also what I've done is taken water hoses a water hose and uh, and flooded this space next to the foundation because that space between the soil and the foundation can become a nesting site for many types of ants. And when you flood that, you find uh, the ants flood out and uh, uh, like that. One time in Florida, I went around a house and found uh, nine different colonies of seven different species of ants 
simply by pulling the grass and vegetation away from the base of the foundation of, of the uh, structure. Um, so that was kind of an interesting uh, case. Uh, shows you how much ants love this interface between the moisture, moist soil and vegetation and the structure itself. Lift things, you'll find ants. Go against the base of trees for soil nesting ants, uh, uh, Argentine ants, uh, odorous house ants, crazy ants, also fire ants, you know, uh, you know, brush the soil away from and tree roots around the foundation, uh, look for ants. Uh, you might use your hands or use a little hand rake to do that, uh, particularly in fire ant country. Use flushing agents to flush ants out, particularly carpenter ants. In this case, uh, in uh, Florida, uh, spraying uh, pyrethrum up in, uh, actually this was tri-dye dust, which has pyrethrums in it. Um, this was the aerosol dust, but spray pyrethrums up into location to locate the ants. And uh, spray it, uh, uh, and all these uh, um, uh, uh, white-footed ants come out of this void that was up in, inside of this uh, porch that uh, was flushed out using, using the pyrethrins. Uh, this house also in Florida had big-headed ants inside a patio room or sunroom inside the house. Uh, we traced those. We couldn't find them next to the house, but when we picked up these patio stones, we found colonies underneath them, and we found tree roots that the ants were following from nest in a tree, also following the roots underneath and underneath all the way to the house and up in, and then, then exiting and coming up into the house. So lift items under, and look underneath them. Again, look under patio, uh, under potted plants. Uh, I was with a technician in, in uh, Louisiana and uh, we, I was watching him do his work and saw him walk right by. A, uh, uh, he saw a, a trail of ants running up uh, uh, the walls and so he went back to his truck because he's doing inspection. Went back to his truck to get his B and G. And one of the key things that you want to do when you're looking for ants is make sure that you have a sprayer with you, uh, with a properly registered uh, or labeled uh, water-based product uh, that you can drench ant mounds with. Because as you expose these ant mounds, you need to drench them immediately. But he was going to go back and, and treat the the um, uh, nest. Uh, I mean, treat the uh, uh, trail, and he completely ignored the potted plant, which is right next to the trail. When he came back with his B and G, I, I asked him to lift the potted plant. Here you see, lift the potted plant. Here's the crazy ant nest associated with potted plant, and they're going up to the second floor, onto the patio, and eventually would have entered the structure in the bedroom beyond. And he was going to walk right by this common nesting site and just treat the trail instead of looking for the colony. And uh, you want to treat the trail too, but you also want to find and treat the colony. So don't forget that. Here's a uh, founding nest of carpenter ants underneath a potted plant on a deck. Um, and uh, eventually they would have moved to another location, but uh, it's easy enough to take care of this gnat nest if you have your B&G with you or your sprayer with you. But if you don't have your sprayer with you and you put your, it, now that you disturb this nest, uh, when you come back with your sprayer in five, 10 minutes, however long it takes, this ant nest will abscond and probably be gone. You won't find it. So that's why carrying your sprayer with you as you inspect for ants is a, is a good practice to get into so you can drench these ant nests as you, as you discover them. Look for piles of sawdust or frass. Here's a, a tree hole. You can see the frass here and the carpenter ant on the outside. And uh, this is typically what they do. Here's a dead ant. Carpenter ant frass has dead ants or pieces of ants associated with it. There was a pile of frass at the bottom. This, these ants here were actually taking the frass and bringing it to the edge and dropping it outside the nest. So the ants would drop it inside the bottom of the tree hole, and then other ants would carry it and drop it outside the, the, the column, outside the, the tree hole. So at my sister's house in Indiana, noticed her tree. Uh, eventually, they tell this tree was dying because it had holes behind the bark. Uh, she eventually had to have this tree taken out because it was right next to her garage. But I noticed this hole, and when you get closer to the hole, you notice that there's carpenter ants nesting behind it. Uh, so that's the source of carpenter ants, uh, or probably a, 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 a uh, uh, parent nest uh, associated with a tree. Uh, it could have eventually sent out a satellite colony infesting your house. Any plants that collects debris can become a nesting site for ants. So check the leaf, 
litter and other debris that collects in plants with have upward uh, facing fronds. Gravel, especially gravel is put in sand uh, or stones that are set in sand are great places. This is Argentine ants, see all the ants on the, this is, there was half a dozen ant uh, colonies in this gravel associated with this gravel. And I'll show you a picture here in a little later when we talk about case histories uh, uh, associated with this. But gravel is a good sign. You rake the gravel over uh, to, to expose and get the ants active and expose the ant colonies. Look for trails um, along edges and corners. Again, structural guidelines. Eric Carpenter ant following a structural guideline. Uh, I like to take jelly or, or uh, gel and bait and bait the corners and the edges of uh, windowsills, uh, hose bibs where the hose faucet is, corners of doorways or patios, and put out little dots of gel as I'm doing my inspection and come back and check. You'll be surprised how many different ants um, you expose, different types of ants, as well as numbers of ant uh, sites that you can end up baiting uh, for ants or following a trail back to a colony just by doing this pre-baiting. Here's a robust uh, crazy ants on a, a dot of jelly in Florida. In this particular case, uh, put out this granular bait just to see what I find. Had big headed ants uh, show up on this granular bait. And here's the entrance hole to the nest right here at the base of this garage. Here's the pile of bait that I put out and in a corner, kind of a protected location when the garage door is down and the ants found that within a few minutes and trailed them right back there, carrying the bait right to this point. And that was a site we could treat and drench for, for ants using a crack and crevice tip or a pen stream on the uh, B&G. Uh, put out, and you can say, again, you can use jelly, you can use ant gel. Uh, put it out. Here's Odor's house ants really uh, feeding on this uh, bait. And you recruit more to the bait. And uh, then they, they immediately go back, start going back once they're full and then buy back to the colony. And just a few feet away was this gap in the, this is my house in Memphis area, and uh, the gap in the uh, sealant had broken away, and they were entering behind the brick veneer and um, could have been getting into my kitchen. My kitchen is right behind there. So I was able to treat this with, with a uh, dust product uh, and uh, then seal up this hole and uh, take care of that before it became a problem. And my wife noticed that ants were in the house, and I usually get in trouble when that happens because I'm supposed to be the entomologist. Uh, to take care of those things. Uh, house in Texas, just doing some pre-baiting, put out some ant gel. I even got uh, pill bugs feeding on it, but I got these acrobat ants, and they were coming out of a hole right here in the windowsill. That's where those acrobat ants came. So I didn't know I had acrobat ants in this house. Um, just put a little drop of gel uh, bait uh, here and uh, trace it right back to this gap in the, in the, in the caulking around the window. So the best success you're going to have is treat colonies, as I mentioned. You put, treat them directly. Carry the B&G, carry your hose in sprayer, whatever you, backpack sprayer, whatever you use, uh, properly labeled water-based material for drenching ant mounds. They treat ant mounds as they're uncovered uh, in leaf litter, mulch, uh, under items. Um, it gets you the best results and the quickest results. makes the most efficient use of your time. Um, Perimeter treatments, they are valuable, particularly the, the greater the number of ants or the more serious the ant problem. Understand that if you do this as your only or primary way to control ants, you're probably not going to have long-term success in controlling an infestation, particularly a chronic or severe infestation. Because what happens with a, a perimeter treatment is that the ants in large populations, tawny crazy ants, Argentine ants, um, uh, Sometimes odorous house ants. Our numbers are so large that the ants trail across these the, the insecticide, which most of our insecticides today are less repellent or non-repellent. Uh, they trail across them, and they eventually sacrifice a lot of workers are killed, but they wear a place where there's no more insecticide uh, through that treated zone and uh, continue to infest the structure. So you kill a lot of ants, but you don't really take care of the problem because you haven't treated the colonies. So if you're going to do perimeter treatments or add perimeter treatments as part of your overall ant control program, you still must treat, find and treat as many colonies as you can if you want to have any time, type of long-term success. When you're in Southern California, you're in Southern uh, or Central Florida, Southeast Texas, along the coast, 
Louisiana, et cetera. When you're dealing with crazy ants, uh, uh, white-footed ants, ants like that, uh, which have large populations, um, you know, you, you definitely want to consider, you know, having perimeter treatments as well as, as the other and, and, uh, uh, and, and include that as part of your program. But don't do this as your primary source of what you do. If you find ants are nesting under gravel, if you find ants are nesting under mulch, you want to move that mulch around with a rake or a hand rake, expose the ant colony, and soak it and continue to move the soil around uh, to make sure that the treatment penetrates all the way to the depth of that colony. Uh, that's very important. If you just spray the top, you often don't kill the ant colony completely underneath and they can move the colony and continue the infestation. Again, this was the situation where I talked about the uh, uh, ant colonies in, in the mulch at the house where they moved it in. In five days, the ants moved in. This is actually a, a shot uh, spraying uh, uh, the ant colony and then moving the tip down into the uh, mulch itself and treating underneath the mulch where each of these ant colonies had, uh, had moved itself. You do, particularly when you're dealing with fire ants, et cetera. For example, fire ants are, you find fire ants uh, nesting outside and they're vading from outside. You find odorous house ants or Argentine ants nesting outside. Um, they're trailing along the edge of a patio, along the foundation, along uh, uh, windowsills, along brick veneer. You want to go ahead and treat the trail with a pan stream or pan spray, but treat the trail along the edge of the structural guidelines that they're using from where they're entering the structure all the way back to the nest site itself. If you have ants inside, um, you know, and, and, you, and you track them to where there maybe is pavement ants going underneath the, the foundation, uh, underneath the slab, or ants coming from the outside, the nest is outside, but coming inside, you can take a hand duster and you take a pair of needles, pliers, lift the, the uh, carpet up just enough to point the uh, uh, duster in one direction and blow a little dust under the edge of the carpet and then turn it around and blow in the other direction. Start about four feet, three or four feet from a corner and go about every six or eight feet thereafter and do that. Uh, and uh, again, uh, that's a good way to kill the remaining ants that are foraging in the structure because they do trail under edges of carpets. And when you're inspecting and you come into a house and the customer says, I keep seeing ants in the kitchen or I keep seeing ants in the living room and I, and I can't, and you're not seeing ants, take the needle in those pliers and pull up the insulation, I mean the uh, carpet edge a little bit, and look under there periodically. When you find ants, uh, go a little more frequently until you find where they're coming in or going under the slab, or you might even find the actual nest site underneath the carpet itself, and uh, you can treat directly. Uh, that's good inspection tip. Carpenter ants in particular use wires uh, to trail between, inside of walls. Uh, feral ants do the same thing, but we generally don't treat with the residual insecticides for feral ants. We use baits, uh, uh, and I'll mention that in a minute. Um, and we use a plastic tip on our duster so we don't get, and you can see I'm not inside the box itself. I'm behind the box, underneath the box, blowing dust into these wall voids at the outlet joints. This is a very common practice in uh, the Northeast, uh, particularly in the Northwest where we have Campanotus, Vicinus, and Modoc, the the two western carpet ant species, which are very uh, numerous, large colonies, and um, you know upwards of 60,000 or more individuals in the case of Vicinus. So this is a routine practice in those areas when controlling carpenter ants to, to uh, dust the uh, outlets and the voids behind the outlets and the switch plates because they do follow the wires and the plumbing voids uh, from wall to wall and room to room. Baiting. If you're baiting for feral ants, you better be baiting outside. Some research done in, in, uh, in Florida uh, showed that uh, just baiting alone outside of a park, uh, apartment building solved a feral ant problem. During the summer and the warm months, feral ants spend as much as 70% of their time uh, foraging outdoors. So if you're not baiting outdoors in windowsills, uh, edges of uh, underneath, uh, edges of uh, uh, shingles, um, at bases of patios, inside weep holes, things like that, you are missing a, a rare opportunity to put a big dent in the population of feral ants very quickly. 
and also understand that fairlands, large populations can consume this bait very quickly. So you, when you have fairlands, you probably want to go, uh, price the job for follow-up trips for a week after the initial treatment and then again um, three weeks after initial treatment. So you end up with three trips the first month. Uh, if you have a small infestation, probably not uh, important, but you have a chronic or infestation throughout a building, you need to be going back multiple times if you're going to get results. And once you've got through a month of baiting, then you can think about applying residuals into wall voids and uh, along trails, et cetera, uh, to kill remaining ants. But you've got to have time for those ants to feed on the bait and carry it back to the colony and feed the queens and the brood um, the, the bait itself. Granular baits, I mean, we have all different kinds of baits, and what I like to do is give a smorgasbord uh, at first. Give a little bit of bait, uh, and this is fair ants on a, on, uh, on a fence line. This whole fence line had ants. This is 15 feet away from the house, and the ants were feeding outside, and the ants were foraging up to, and this is one of the worst houses I've ever seen with ants all around. I come back about an hour later, all this bait, was, or an hour, hour and a half later, all this bait was gone. So um, it didn't matter what bait I put out. They wanted it. The population was so high. But give them a choice. This works for Argentine ants and odorous house ants, et cetera. And give them a choice and then give them what they, they are feeding on or what they choose, um, you know, uh, and, and go with that bait for a while until they stop feeding on it. Inside, we can use stations to give a variety of bait. Here we've got a liquid, a gel, and a granular bait. These, these kind of stations, this is the... Um, a product made by Rockwell Labs, but there are other kind of bait stations out there that we can use. Uh, we can put bait in directly uh, into outlet boxes. Uh, here we've got uh, granular bait. Uh, we can also uh, apply gel baits into the outlet boxes. You cannot apply, uh, you know, you don't want to apply residual water-based materials in outlet boxes. That is a big no-no. That's electric shock hazard. But when you're dealing with ferroants, if you're not baiting the outlet boxes and the switch plates, you are not controlling infestation. And the good thing about putting the bait in these outlet boxes is that the um, uh, ants tend to stay inside the, inside the walls and they're less likely to be seen by customers as the bait does its job. Also bait inside window sills, open the window and put a bait. You can do it in, in strips if the label, uh, label allows, or you can use granular bait here. You can use uh, liquid bait, you can put a bait station, uh, you know, right next to the screen, uh, a smaller bait station. You know, it, it depends on what you want, but baiting these areas, particularly with feral ants and ants entering from outside, is, is one place that you can bait. Here's a bait station uh, that was placed um, with uh, a, a liquid bait uh, for ants. You can also attach them to trees, certain types of bait stations. You can use liquid bait stations at the base of trees at the base of shrubs, along the foundation, uh, some larger liquid bait stations. You can also put gel and granular baits in those same stations. Um, here's another type of bait station uh, that was tacked to a tree. Uh, understand that when you put these up that raccoons and possums may rip them off. Uh, so this is something you want to check fairly regularly if you're going to do this type of uh, station. Squirrels will also rip them off too to see what was inside. Okay, a few cases. <clears throat> Um, working one day um, at my office building, and the people in the office complained about ants. And he said, hey, "We got ants in my office, in my cubicle." So I go over to the cubicle and I look, and oh, you got odor's house. I mean, you got acrobat ants. Okay. Well, I look behind the the, the, um, um, the cubicle, and on the floor is a couple of pieces of potato chips or some food that had fallen there, and the acrobats were on that as well as trailing on the cubicles. Well, if I know one thing about acrobat ants is they like to nest in wood. And in steel and glass uh, office building, I'm not going to find much wood. So where do I go? Do I spend much time inspecting inside? No. I go immediately outside, okay, at acrobat ants. And I go outside. Here's the outside. And here's where the ants are trailing. I, I go outside. The, this is the area right here at the top uh, is the office where that was affected. These ants were trailing and going up uh, as, we, as we did inspections on each floor. They're going all the way up all six floors. They're trailing here. They're trailing up under the edge of the, um, of the uh, side here and going all the way down this edge, 
across the sidewalk, across the crack, down the edge of the sidewalk. But really what I did when I was at this point, I saw the ants going up, I just turned around and I looked for the wood and there was a tree about 60, 70 feet away. I immediately went to the tree, got acrobat ants in large numbers going up the tree. They're going through the grass to the edge of the, the sidewalk, following all these structural guidelines, grooves and edges all the way up. About 84% I determined of the, the trail was following a structural guideline. So we really couldn't get access to the ant colony up into the tree. So what we did is we treated around the base of the tree, we treated the trail all the way up, treated all the way up and as high as we could. And um, that stopped the ants inside. And we had thousands of dead ants uh, the next day. And then the uh, pest professional who had service for that account was uh, uh, instructed to, every time he came, to check for ant trails and make sure he kept the ants at the tree. Eventually, the tree had a storm. The tree broke in half. They cut down the tree, and that took care of the problem long term. But the, the ant colony was up in some dead port of the tree higher than we could access. Got a call in Tampa, Florida. Crazy ants or ants being seen in a waiting room of a uh, um, hospital. So I went in there and found it much similar to this waiting room. Found ants. There was some food that was crumbs on the floor. The crazy ants were up here. Uh, underneath the desk uh, and crawling on the walls and so here we got the, the desk and the table they were going here then they go across the carpet to this doorway down this wall around this wall and there's a window and outside this window is the first story flat roof so I opened the window went outside followed the trail from the window all the way to the edge of the building so now I had to go back outside the building so about 100 feet down the story and window ledge. So went down the building, found the ant colony, or ant trail, uh, followed it along this window ledge all the way down about 100 feet across a, uh, the brick veneer of a stairwell, or stairway leading into the building, across the sidewalk into a retainer wall, and into an opening on the retainer wall with a large number of, ant, of ants, uh, crazy ants going in and out of the retaining wall. So what we did was we treated inside the voids of the retaining wall with the dust. We used a water-based residual and treated this trail all the way back, little spot treatment, all the way back, all the way up the wall. We went up to the, the uh, room, carried our, our sprayer inside of a, a service kit so that people didn't see the sprayer, went out on the roof. We, we treated the trail on the roof. Inside of the waiting room itself, we used a rag with soapy water, paper towel with soapy water, and wiped the trail away all the way back to the window and all the ants associated with that trail. So what we effectively did is we killed the colony, killed the trail, wiped the ants away in the area where we couldn't actually apply insecticides and solve the problem. This is a church in Indianapolis. Uh, they called us because they had all the sawdust appearing in their, in their uh, baptismal pool outside. This is carpenter ants. This is one week's worth. They'd vacuum it up for Sunday services. And um, another a week later, we got a pile. Uh, directly above this is tongue and groove. You can see where there's been, there's a gap there. There's uh, some moisture damage. So we had to get a ladder and prop it up in there, get into there, uh, drill into this area, and, and treat with dust. But because this may or may not have been a, a primary colony, it's more than likely a satellite colony, but they were investing the wood and uh, hollowing it out. We did a perimeter inspection, and to this tree outside of here, we found a, a primary colony in the tree hole outside of here, and by taking care of that, we took care of the ant problem. Las Vegas, riding with a technician, going to one of his accounts, he goes in, they say, hey, we got ants. We go in there, we look at it, and got, they got uh, acrobat ants. Asked the technician how he's gonna solve the problem. He's the one who to treat the ants. I said, no, that's not the best approach to take. These Argentine ants, they're probably not nesting inside of the sandwich shop. This is a this is a little sandwich shop at the end of a strip mall. So it had a sidewalk in front and going down the, this here to the to the right side. Um, so you, I went to the and followed the ants to the, to the doorway, and then outside the doorway they went across a crack in the slab to this column, and then they followed this crack all the way down. So when I got to this point, I looked out to this area, and I saw this rocky gravel area and you saw the picture earlier we had all the ants 
that were trailing they were on this concrete this is a, this is a better another picture of that so they were going all this all this way so what we did is we wiped up the ants with soapy rag the entry all the way back to the doorway we treated the trail all the way along here back to this location then we raked and moved the the gravel around all the way back all along here there's a half a dozen nests or so and we had to soak those nests with the sprayer um, and uh, uh, to take care of this problem. But the ant ants were actually 75 or 80 feet away from where they're being seen outside. Ants will trail a long distance, uh, particularly some of these like Argentines and crazy ants, older South ants. So keep that in mind. House in Dallas, Texas. Went to the house. There was a chronic problem. Branch asked for help and went out to, to, to help odorous house ants being seen. This is the shower. These are the bait. They put out these little bait things. They didn't have pets or children, so it's okay to put out the, in, the, in the empty cups or the little cups uh, here and the bait stations. These are all the dead ants every day or every couple of days. A homeowner would vacuum them out. So what I did is I looked at this closely, and right here at the bottom, right here is an opening where they, the uh, grout had come loose and there was ants. So obviously they were behind this wall somehow. And um, the, the, t the pest professional was like, should I drill a wall? I said, well, let's wait a minute. And I, says, I said, we're on the second floor. I asked the customer, is there an attic space above this shower? He said, yeah. Is it accessible? He said, yeah. So we went into the attic space. And when I got up into the attic, there's the opening, got up in the attic, and I looked over to the right. Uh, this is the vent stack for that shower and the plumbing in that bathroom. Look at all the odorous house ants on there. They were all through the insulation here, all the way back. This is a lot of odorous house ants. So they were nesting in the wall. They were nesting in the insulation, around the insulation, and going out uh, onto the roof area, of the, the gutters, et cetera, foraging for food. And uh, So here's another shot. So we had to uh, dust inside the insulation because I didn't want to soak it with water. It's not a good thing to do to insulation is drench it with a lot of water-based insecticide. So I uh, used dust, uh, moved the insulation around, dusted that, uh, uh, used a water-based spot treatment for all the ants on the uh, on the vent stack, moved the insulation away because I could reach that area and, and, and applied dust uh, down into the uh, void where the vent stack went into the wall. We did drill and treat um, through the grout, drilling tiny, tiny holes and dust into the wall voids around the uh, um, the the shower area um, at the top uh, of the shower, and then uh, reseal those holes with caulk, uh, and uh, that resolved the problem. Uh, but the ants were actually nesting in the attic and not in the wall. So keep in mind, sometimes uh, these ants, Argentine ants, I found in the attic, crazy ants, I found in the attic, odorous house ants. Keep in mind that they may be up in the attic as well as inside the walls. Hey, Stoyt. Hey, Stoyt. Yeah. It's Brad with PCT. Hey, um, terrific presentation, and I'm sorry, but uh, I, we're going to kind of uh, wrap Stoyt. things up here. Uh, I, we want to make sure we leave some time here from, from to hear from uh, Ryan from MGK. So uh, I apologize that, uh, to, to have My to fault you. My going long. No, no worries. But uh, maybe we'll just go over a couple quick questions here that came in while, um, you know, while you're giving your presentation, while we're switching over to Ryan here. Um, just a, a question came in. Uh, a gentleman that works for a school district said that, uh, you know, kind of in the August, September area, when school starts, he'll get calls about uh, fire ants. And uh, most of the times he has trouble finding the fire ants outside. It's hard to tell exactly where they're coming from. What kind of strategy would you recommend for trying to prevent um, these fire ant issues before the school year starts, Pre fire ant prevention in a school district? Well, if you're dealing with school, a, a school district and fire ant territory, I would recommend using uh, granular baits, um, a, uh, particularly one with IGR uh, and, and in the spring. The earlier you start, um, you know, applying the bait according to label directions, in the, in the spring, uh, after it gets starts getting warm and the ants get active, the fewer ant colonies you will have around the property. Uh, follow label directions and your state regulations. If you're in some states, some states may limit how far you can apply uh, around the structure unless you have a lawn ornamental license. 
so have proper licensing, uh, follow label directions, and use granular baits and start those early in the year before you start having the problem. This is in the spring when school's still in session, but before summer comes and the populations grow large, and then when you come back to school in the fall, you know, the populations are there. Um, you know, ant, fire ants can trail from long, long distances. If it's a strictly dry area, the, the mounds may, may not be all that evident or all that big. Uh, if it's very wet outside, that's when you see the large, big ant mounds when there's a lot of rain. Uh, so that ants could be shallow in the lawn, underneath the mulch, uh, living under underneath uh, patio stones, et cetera. Great. A couple more questions here before we move on. And again, you know, since we didn't get to as many questions maybe as we'd hoped for, um, if you want to send them to us, we'll be ha happy to pass those along to Stoy, and, and he can uh, he can follow up with you. Um, a couple questions were. Uh, one question that came in was: Is the beetle in your dimorphic slide an obligate commensal? The beetle what? The beetle, so in your dimorphic slide, the beetle that's in your dimorphic slide, an obligate commensal? Uh, it might be. Uh, I didn't really pay attention. Uh, it, it probably was, but I really didn't look that closely uh, at, at, the, at, the, at the beetle itself. I have to go back and look at the picture. Uh, sure. But more than likely it was. If it's associated with or found in the ant colony, it probably is. Okay. Um, and then, you know, the last question we'll, we'll uh in your way is uh, have the big headed ants overtaken fire ants? No, uh, fire ants tend to be uh, more competitive. Uh, you know, in certain areas, uh, you have the African uh, big headed ant in, in central South Florida, they can have huge colonies. I uh, once tracked a colony that seemed to be the whole of the whole uh, neighborhood block. Uh, the ants all seem to be tied together. Uh, they can successfully complete against uh, fire ants, but uh, um, but smaller uh, big-headed ant colonies near really don't stand a chance. It's just they're just too numerous. Uh, the fire ants. Okay. All right. Well, uh, story. Like I said, uh, we're, we're a little short on time there, but I uh, appreciate you answering those questions and uh, thanks for a terrific presentation on ants and, and all those uh, case studies. Really interesting as well. You're welcome. Y'all take care. Thank you. All right. Um, so we're going to move on to the next part of our, our program here. And uh, again, we want to thank MGK for sponsoring this business booster. And next, we're going to hear from Ryan Neff, who's the West Coast Technical Field Specialist for MGK. Um, quickly about Ryan, he has an MS in entomology from Texas A&M and a PhD uh, from, in entomology from University of California, Riverside. So Ryan's been with MGK since April 2019, and he provides support to those in the residential, commercial, and ag industries. Uh, this includes technical advice, insect management protocols, and field-based research. So with that, we're going to turn things over to Ryan. Appreciate it, Brad. Uh, can you hear me all right? Loud and clear. Excellent. And you can see my screen. Oh, uh, Brad, are you able to? I'll, I'll just assume that's a yeah. And uh, if anybody else can't see it, just please chime in. So yeah, uh, this is, um, I'll go through this pretty quick because I do want to get to a couple of um, case studies using uh, these products. Uh, and a lot of it is going to piggyback off of some key points that Story was talking about. And those are when you're dealing with those polydomus or multi-colonial and polygyne, multi-queen ant species, you're usually dealing with lots of satellite colonies. You're dealing with massive numbers. And in the case of something like an Argentine ant, you're having 17 queens for every thousand workers. So if you've got a really bad infestation, you know, if you're in Southern California and you're backing up to a citrus grove or something like that, um, and I use that as a specific thing because I collected all my ants for my dissertation when I was at UCR uh, from citrus groves, particularly grapefruits, you're dealing with tens of millions of ants. And if you're dealing with tens of millions of ants, you're dealing with, you know, in some cases, um, tens of thousands of queens. Um, so that whole, you know, when we talk about some species of ants, like, uh, you know, take the red imported fire ants, as long as it's not the polygyne social form, if you've got a single queen down there and you kill that queen off, yeah, you're golden. Uh, that colony is going to be wiped out um, and you're good to go. But if you've got tens of thousands of queens and numerous satellite colonies, that whole kill the queen, kill the colony uh, paradigm, that doesn't really apply in those cases. And really with the Samari liquid, that was what it was designed for. Um, so the Samari liquid, it, it spans this nice um, 
it, or it, it kind of has a twofold thing where it's it's got a very broad label. You can broadcast it outdoors. Uh, you can use it both outdoors and indoors. But on top of that, it's got a very long residual. It's got a 90 day residual on that. And part of that is because of the active ingredients that we're using in there. Uh, for those of you that are familiar with Nygaard, it's got pyroproxfen in there. Um, and we also have clothianid in it. And I'll, I'll talk about that real quick. Um, I, I'm going to skip through this pr pretty quick because I think I can cover this as we get to it. Um, but in terms of indoor outdoor use, you know, that's going to save you time. And especially in terms of, you know, if, for anybody on the call that may have, you know, one product that they use on structure to give you a really good residual and a non repellent uh, type of product. Um, you may also have another BNG with something that you can use out or inside or something that you can use off structure. Um, and so Samari kind of fits both of those needs. It's it's going to give you that long residual when you're applying it around a structure, on a structure, or even out in the yard. Um, but you can also take that thing inside if you need to. You can use it off structure. Um, so really, if you're seeing pests anywhere um, in the house, you're you're going to be able to use it there. So compliance-wise, it's, uh, it's a little bit easier. Um, not only ants, it's really good for German cockroaches, fleas, um, uh, you know, things that even though they're not social insects, they are commu communal insects and, you know, things that you would typically add an IGR for, for control or for longer term control. Um, so you've got that included in there without needing to tank mix anything. Uh, because it's a neonic and an IGR, you don't have the pyrethroid restrictions. Um, and no signal word. Some of you may be familiar with Crossfire. That's a uh, clothianidin dominant um, uh, product. And like uh, Crossfire, this has clothianidin in it. And because of the uh, the system that we're using, the EW formulation, uh, we pulled out a lot of the the really, I guess, dang not dangerous, but the the solvents that would lend it to having say caution on the label um we were able to get that off of there because we use more specialized solvents that uh, allow this to go into solution um or be in solution with water in the bottle so you don't have the same amount of solvents as you would with uh, say some scs or uh, micro cap products so we got clothianidin a neonic non-repellent really long lasting and this is part of how we get the uh, 90 day residual on it is clothianidin. If you compare the water solubility to other neonics, it is at the bottom in terms of being water soluble. So the formulation itself, we're able to get that in solution with water. But once you apply that, um, you know, either outdoors or indoors and those solvents dry off or they dissipate um, and you're left with the active ingredient, that active ingredient is not getting washed away by, you know, normal sprinklers going off uh, typical rainfall. You know, if you have a tropical storm or a hurricane or, you know, two inches of rain in 30 minutes, it, it, that stuff is, I mean, even if it's on the soil, it's probably going to move that soil off site. So it's not going to be where you put it no matter what you apply. But normal irrigation events, normal rain events, this stuff hangs around very, very well. Um, so that's one of the big reasons we uh, we use clothianidin for this one. And then Nygaard, if you're familiar with uh, pyroproxfen, the active ingredient in Nygaard, very long outdoor residual, up to six months. Um, and, you know, this mixed in there, it, you know, if you're treating for fleas, roaches, flies, you don't need to add a, um, a NIGR to that mix. All right, so I'm not going to go over the formulation too much other than to say it mixes up pretty nicely. Um, in terms of mortality, all of these slides, they're just showing that it kills um, within a reasonable time frame, but not too quickly. And that's because Argentine, Odorous House, Pharaoh Ants, um, and Stoy mentioned a couple of others like uh, White-Footed Ants, uh, Crazy Ants, where you have numerous satellite colonies. You want to give that product time to, you don't want to kill them too fast. You want them to transfer that throughout the other members of that colony and get a higher body count, you know, for lack of a, a better term. So we tested this on Pharaoh, Argentine, Odorous House. Uh, smaller ants like pharaoh ants, it's starting to work within four hours and Argentine odorous house, you're getting within a day to three days. Uh, and then it also wipes out the brood. So by 24 hours for uh, pharaoh and Argentine ants, it's wiped out all the brood um, and it takes about three to four days for it to wipe out all the odorous house ant brood. Um, so again, you're getting penetration into the colony, not just with the workers, but with the, with the larvae and with the queens as well. Um, so we tested this outdoors and when we did this, we didn't do 
any, it, this isn't based on a lab study. This is based in conjunction with the university, treated tile and concrete, stuck them on top of the entomology building at that university and aged it over the summer for however long it took. So uh, if they got rain, uh, winds blowing, whatever it is, it was exposed to those um, uh, elements. And in the case with uh, carpenter ants, uh, indoor aged, 100% mortality across the board. Um, and we still had 90% mortality with carpenter ants after 90 days aged outdoors. And that's on both concrete and tile. Uh, for pharaoh ants, 100% across the board, both indoor and outdoor, with the exception of 95% mortality with the, the tile, which honestly, that was kind of unexpected because I would have figured a porous surface like concrete would have dropped as opposed to the tile. But, you know, things happen. Uh, it delivers transfer effect. We tested this out in a semi-field study with pharaoh ants where they had to cross a treated surface to get pick up food and then take it back to the colony. And without treating the colonies directly, those foraging workers brought that back in and killed the queens, killed the brood and the rest of the colony. So demonstrated that it, under as close to field conditions as we could control, this has excellent transfer effect. Um, I'm gonna skip over some of these questions real quick. Uh, I will say, I'm out here in California, and because we're our, the California Department of Pesticide Regulations and Cal EPA, they are revisiting all of the neonics. So California, is, we're still waiting on registration. New York has pretty much a ban on um, a lot of the neonic products anyway, so it's not going to be available in New York. Uh, California, we will have registration. We're just still waiting on Cal EPA to, or Cal DPR to figure out where they want to go with that. Okay, so... I'm gonna skip over the gel bait stuff pretty quick, other than to say this gel bait, it also contains clothianidin. So the same active ingredient that's in uh, the Samari insecticide concentrate. And what you have is it's, it's fitting in this nice area between killing quickly, but not too quickly. Um, and I'm gonna talk about the Samari system. And this is really just a marketing uh, thing to say, if you use baits to draw ants out or draw them over a non-repellent material, you're gonna get better control. Um, Stoy mentioned a couple of cases where if you're doing those perimeter treatments, you've got ants that may be trailing inside. Well, if you've got a massive colony like Argentine, Odorous House, if you've got a bunch of um, carpenter ant satellite colonies, uh, they're gonna trail over a specific area, but they're gonna wear off the pesticide. So you've got a ton of, uh, you know, residual product around there, but they've worn off this one little area where they've gone through. And so you have all of this other product that's not, that's not actually getting to the insects. Um, my previous job, I, I was, I spent four years as director of education at a pest control company here in California before I joined MGK. And because ants were my thing, I trained the technicians to look, if you're going to go out, if you've got a call back um, and you're going to be implementing either a residual non-repellent or a bait, use them in conjunction with each other. So if you're going to go do a band treatment around a house, do that band treatment. If you're going to go inside and do any kind of uh, liquid residuals, do that. Go outside, look around the bases of trees, look in bark mulch, look for areas where they may be nesting. But the most important thing is to find those trails and, you know, let's say you weren't able to find every single colony associated with an odorous house or a carpenter, carpenter ant or a um, uh, Argentine ant infestation. Well, if you find as many trails as you can and you apply your liquid non-repellent around that area, and then after it's either dry or if you want to do it, you know, off to the side, if you bait to draw them over that liquid non-repellent, you're going to give them a reason to actually cross your material and it works really really well um I, you know i wouldn't recommend this this isn't like your standard look every single house i go to i'm going to employ this attract and kill process where i put out a liquid residual and then bait over the top of it um, or bait around it to draw them over it but if you're dealing with a callback if you know you're dealing with a really problematic uh multi-colonial or polydomus ant like an argentine odorous house uh, pharaoh carpenter ant um, uh, utilizing the bait to draw them over is really really helpful now even though i just told you you know bait for carpenter ants sometimes they'll take gel baits it, it kind of depends on their um what they're wanting what they like at that time me personally when i'm dealing with carpenter ants i usually go for uh, granular baits so the samari gel bait 
I, I wouldn't recommend it for carpenter ants or fire ants or thing or ants that typically prefer a granular bait, but ants that are highly sugar loving, like Argentine odorous house, um, depending on when you catch them and where you catch them, the, uh, um, acrobat ants can be that way. Um, but they really go to baits. And so in this case, we've got a second story apartment unit, which happens to be mine. And obviously this is, you know, you do not want to apply to a food contact surface like a counter. So if you were doing this, you would go back underneath the cabinet or you'd bait outside. Um, I did this, you know, in my own apartment because I needed to take photos and video of it. Um, and it's much harder to get video if I'm going back underneath the sink. So I, I did it out in the open just to demonstrate that baiting alone, it only wiped these out for about 10 days. And that's because on the exterior of this property, I've got a bunch of bark mulch. I have very dense vegetation. I have oleander, which has oleander aphids. So they're feeding on the honeydew from that. And by going outside and applying a liquid residual plus baiting anywhere that I'm seeing those colonies, I'm, draw I'm drawing those exterior populations over that liquid uh, non-repellent and then they're back throughout the colony. So you're distributing more active ingredient into a lot more colonies much quicker than you are through either baiting or treating alone. So here's another case. And this is actually, I, I just treated this house last night. Um, this was my old house and we were friends with the, you know, the people that ended up buying it from us. And when I was checking out to see what they liked, I put peanut butter, I put jelly, I put a piece of salami, and then I put a napkin that's coated with a, or that's, you know, been dunked in sugar water. They're all over that sugar water. And then when I went out and I applied that Samari gel bait, the odorous house ants are just all over that. And they're coming out from a gap here in the, um, in the threshold. And that's going underneath the deck in the backyard. And that's where that nest is. So not only can I really not access the, the deck easily, like I could blindly kind of, uh, apply material around the outside, but the way that it's constructed, there's no access to it. I can't get under there very easily and I'm spraying blindly, but you know, by applying a bait that they're really, they're really uh, interested in, I'm going to move a lot of product into that colony as quickly as possible. And then here's going back to what story was also saying about that polydomus or those multiple nesting structures or multiple, uh, uh, colonies within a nest, you know, in this particular area, you know, let's take this house. If you can see my cursor, um, you know, I identified three colonies out here. I treated it, got rid of them, but now I've got ants coming into that second story bathroom because the house next door is not on service and they're crossing that tree that's overhanging the property line going into the house. Well, if I want to try to move as much product into that, you know, into my, into that neighboring colony, because I can't actually access it, I'm going to use baits and I'm also going to treat around there with a non-repellent like Samari. That way, as they cross it to get that bait, they're going to take both bait and the active ingredient back throughout that colony. And in this case, even if I can't wipe out all of the colonies, if I can knock out that satellite colony that is crossing over the property line, that's at least going to make me have a happy customer, or happy homeowner. So just to kind of uh, revisit everything, the insecticide, the liquid residual, indoor outdoor use plus broadcast outdoors, 90 day residual, um, great on multi queen species, no signal word, you've got the Nygard IGR already built into it. Um, in addition, what I, one thing I didn't say is, um, there's no reapplication interval. So, you know, if you go in and you treat one day and, you know, heaven forbid, you have to go back out there and treat again, which hopefully you wouldn't have to, but if you did, that wouldn't be off label. You can go back out there and retreat if you need to. Um, and then with the gel bait, indoor outdoor use, including food areas while they're in uh, operation, it starts working within 24 hours. So you're gonna start seeing results pretty quick on this. Um, this 90 day residual, that's that's based on laboratory data. What I will say is when I've tested this out in California and Arizona, um, as long as you're not applying it on like a an open surface to the sun when it's getting up to like 105, 110 degrees, uh, if you're applying this underneath vegetation in areas out of direct sunlight, it holds up really nicely outdoors. It's not going to run on you and it's going to be palatable for a while. So, um, you know, especially with the Argentine odorous house and infestation if you're looking to move as much active into that colony within that first kind of four to 12 hour window um, it's going to hold up very nicely for you outdoors um, it's 
very palatable to sugar loving ants and just like the the liquid residual there's no signal word so I, I know i sped through that pretty quick because i just wanted to get to the uh the questions if anybody does have any thanks ryan uh terrific presentation and uh, a couple folks did ask um to, for your uh, contact information to, to get a hold of you uh i don't know if you want to pass that along uh yeah uh, can i type it into the uh into the chat area sure okay uh all right so and just for anybody that's listening it's uh oh and let me know i think that said organizers and panelists maybe i need to open that up to uh yeah I'll switch it to everyone wait okay um i can't do that so let me tell you what i'm just gonna i'll just type it on here i'll add a slide my sure. email is ryan.neff at mgk.com and my contact is 612-750-4221 and for real i i love talking about like different ant accounts and strategies to do that so feel free um anytime you know hit me up and then i can also put you in touch with whoever the uh, mgk sales rep is in your particular area and along the same lines, a couple folks have asked us for copies of Stoys and Ryan's presentation. Um, we are recording this, and we'll post it once we get it edited and uh, web optimized and all that kind of stuff. We'll add it up to, we'll upload it to our website, and we'll also provide a copy to MGK so you can view it from our website. You could also get it from your MGK rep as well. Um, Ryan, a couple more questions for you here. Um, does a uh, uh, I apologize in advance. Clofinidin, does it break down in imidacloprid? Uh, it, so, wait, when you say does it break down in imidacloprid, are you asking does it um, break down I, over time? It just says break down in it in, in, okay. imid, in imidacloprid. Um, it, yeah, so if, if you had an imidacloprid product and that was out there and then you applied uh, Samari, which is called the they're not going to, they're not going to interact. They're not going to break, break each other down. So it, they're not mutually exclusive. Um, and imidacloprid, uh, it's, it's still going to give you a pretty solid residual outdoors. Clothianidin is just a little bit less water soluble. So it holds up, um, a little bit better under, uh, like irrigation events. Um, but no, they're not going to like negatively impact one another. So they're not mutually exclusive. Uh, Ryan, a question was, um, is it possible to control ants with uh, exterior-only treatments? If so, what product would you recommend? And if so, at a minimum, what would need to be treated on the inside? That's, <laughs> I don't know if that's a loaded question by somebody waiting for me to make a misstep or not, but I, it's, it's yes and no. It, it very much depends on the situation. Um, for instance, with Argentine odor house ants, if I'm if I only find trails on one side of the house and I missed it on the other side, then no, I'm probably not going to get control. Another case would be is if you have a, a an ant infestation that has been either trapped indoors or is only nesting indoors. In that case, uh, no, you wouldn't be able to get control of it. Um, now, uh, just for the sake of uh, my answer to this question, I'm going to talk about Argentine ants or odors house ants as the example, because in general, you've got satellite colonies around a house that move around frequently. And in general, they're not solely nesting indoors, especially Argentine ants. They usually need some form of soil contact unless you've got in areas in the Southeast where it's super, super humid and they may be able to establish an indoor colony. Out here on the west coast we don't get that too much it's it's usually in the soil somewhere and if you're if you do exterior baiting because again they're going inside to find resources that they're not getting on the exterior um if you give them a reason to come back outside they're definitely gonna go for it um now if you're what products would i recommend i would say obviously i'm biased towards mgk because you know we sat here and put this presentation on but if you're only treating on structure any of the fipronil based products are going to work very very well too um the advantage with samari comes in you're getting a similar um residual as the fipronil products but you don't have to worry about um taking that off structure samari you can just apply it anywhere um but i would say neonix and fipronil based products um for the exterior and then using bait to draw them out of the structure that would be my that would be my recommendation is 
is a general answer to that without seeing the the actual infestation or knowing what species you're dealing with. Uh, Ryan, a question was, um, will Samari take care of big headed ant problems in Florida? So our East Coast technical rep, Tommy Powell, has tried them down in Florida and it worked very well. Now, this I am preface this by saying I don't know which species he was dealing with or, or he was treating down there. Like Stoy said, there's the African big headed ant. I believe it's Fidoli megacephala is that can have massive, massive colonies that can almost be neighborhood wide. Um, and so in that case, the ability to have broadcast with Samari, it's it would be an excellent option for that. Um, but it, yeah, in the experience that we've had, it has worked very well for big headed ants. And we've even had some really good success with fire ants that we weren't expecting. Um, and I'll get into that just real quick by saying with fire ants, especially red imported fire ants, our assumption was, okay, well, you know, we don't know how it's going to get back in there because baiting is primarily, I mean, I mean, I grew up in Texas. That's, that was the number one ant and the number one way we got rid of it was doing a granular product um, to exploit that foraging behavior. But if you're dealing with a, you know, residential home, something like that, where you can find those ants in the yard. When we had companies test this out, they would spray over the top of a nest for like a couple of seconds. And that would disturb the nest enough to where they came in and they were, you know, they had to rebuild it. And as they're rebuilding, they're coming in contact with that soil that's been treated with Samari. And because it's a non-repellent um, transferable material, as they're doing that, and then they return back throughout the colony, they were spreading it throughout the rest of the colony. And so we got this really unexpected, uh, you know, control on fire ants in a situation that we really weren't, we didn't anticipate. So that was a long winded way of saying, yeah, it works on uh, Fidoli or on the big headed ants in Florida, and it works on red imported fire ants too. All right. Well, Ryan, that's all we have for you as far as questions, but uh, I want to thank you uh, for a great presentation and a very informative uh, presentation and make folks know about the new Samari from MGK. And uh, again, thanks to Stoy Hedges for his presentation. Uh, terrific job, Stoy. And um, just kind of before I turn things over, uh, Ryan, I'll just kind of pass it back to you if you want to uh, pass along any final words. Uh, nope. All, all I got is, you know, ant management, like in Stoy's presentation, it is situational. It depends on uh, the species and the environment you're in. Odor's house ants or Argentine ants on the East Coast behave, you know, somewhat differently than they do on the West Coast. And so if you ever have any questions about that or if you just kind of want to shoot the breeze about ant control in general, uh, feel free to contact me. I, you know, that's that's my job here. So and I like doing it. So feel free to hit me up anytime. Great. Thanks a lot, Ryan. And uh, again, thanks to all of our uh, all of our uh, listeners, our readers for uh, for joining us today. Have a great day, everybody. Thanks, everybody.
get shot at, 